queen because he just banished his former queen for not appearing at his beck and call at a drunken party. Smart gal. So there's a search. A search for a new queen. A search for the most beautiful maiden in all of the kingdom. It sounds like we're in a Disney thing. And people come to the house where all the gals get together. Can you imagine just the little bit of bickering that you see or the lot of bickering that you see on the bathroom? <laughs> she said this, she said that. What was going on in the citadel of Susa, the capital city of Persia? Well, they all came to the house for a year's worth, it says, of beauty treatments. And a young Jewish woman by the name of Hadassah was among those beauties who came to Susa. And as it turns out, in the final rose ceremony, she was chosen. We know her as Queen Esther of Persia. Now, if you've been following the story and you were here last week, you might be a little confused. I had to look a couple times, too. Because last week when Mark Carlson preached, and as we read in chapter 19, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, had been captive in Babylon for many decades. And they were, last week, <laughs> let go to go back to Babylon. It was the return home. It was wonderful. So what in the world are we doing way back east again in Persia? Well, a short answer would be, when the Persian king Cyrus conquered the Babylonians, he looked around and said, what are all these Jews doing here? Y'all go home to Jerusalem, rebuild your temple, I'll even fund it for you. And as we learned, 50,000 Jews did so. Many more Jews stayed back in what was now the Persian Empire. They became what we might call resident aliens of the Persian Empire. They lived there. They worked there. Persia was their home. And they weren't particularly interested in moving way, way far away to a distant land where their great-grandparents grew up. That's why we're back in Persia for this part of of the story. And what a story we get in chapter 20. And every story, every good story, needs a villain. And we are introduced at the beginning of this chapter to the villain named Haman. Haman became King Xerxes. Now we got, we're a couple kings past Cyrus. But King Xerxes' right hand man, let's call him the prime minister. He was so filled with himself that he demanded that everyone in the court, all the court officials, would kneel down and worship him. Well, there's this one guy with a funny name, at least if you were in the Midwest, Mordecai. It never even crossed my mind to name my son Mordecai. But Mordecai, who happened to be Queen Esther's uncle, who, when she was young, adopted her into his home because her parents had died. So he raised this, this woman, Esther. Mordecai would not bow down. That ticked Haman off who subsequently devised a plan not only to impale Mordecai on a 75-foot pole very publicly, but also to exterminate all the Jews living in the Persian Empire. If you have your copy of the story with you, turn with me to page 280. I'm going to be in the third full paragraph. It's Esther chapter 3, verse 7. Third paragraph on 280. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the poor, 
not poor, like P-O-O-R. Now, this is where pronunciation really comes into play. Do you say poor or poor or like P-O-O-R? I don't know. You know, anyways. The poor, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month, and the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Adar. With permission from King Xerxes, Haman here rolled the dice, literally, to determine a random date on which to kill the Jews. Nice story. Mordecai, Uncle Morty, sends word to Queen Esther about this king-sanctioned plan, saying, hey, you've got to tell your husband. You've got to intercede. You've got to prevent this. And you know what Esther said? I can't. I won't. Look at the bottom of page 281. Last couple sentences. It's Esther 4.11. She says, Don't you know, Uncle Morty, any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares them. And you know what? I haven't been summoned by the king for 30 days, so I don't think it's a very good idea. I just can't. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation in which you knew the right thing to do, but because it would be difficult, you couldn't, or wouldn't? It would be too risky, too, too difficult. It might cost you more than you were willing to pay as far as the cost to your reputation or the security you have in your job or the security that you're standing you have among your peers or your friends. That was Esther. It was then that Mordecai said some very important things. Lessons for Esther and for us today. He said at the top of the next page, and this is Esther 4, verse 14, If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. What's that all about? In other words, as has been the case throughout our study of the story, God is going to be successful. God is going to be successful as he's working out his plan to once again live in a right relationship, a loving and trusting relationship with his people. It's going to happen with or without you. With or without you, but oh, how much better with you. The kingdom of God will come, and God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but oh, how much better if it comes to us and through us. For whatever reason, God has chosen to work through people like you and like me, like Mordecai and like Esther. And then the rest of that verse, probably the best known part of Esther. And who knows, says Mordecai, but who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In other words, maybe, just maybe, you are where you are right now to make an important difference in God's unfolding plan. Maybe you are in this particular circumstance and particular place and the particular time and in relationship with these particular people so that you can be used by God 
Maybe, just maybe, someone at work where you work, or someone in your neighborhood where you live is hurting, or maybe someone in school where you are, high school, elementary school, college, wherever, maybe you've got a class with someone, maybe your lockers are next to each other, maybe your dorm room is in the same place, maybe you are right where you are for such a time as this. Esther, maybe you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. These words must have worked on her heart, and, and maybe they'll work on your hearts too. It's not perhaps what you have done on your own. It's not what you had thought. You might have thought, uh, 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 not me, not now. It's not a very convenient time. But maybe God is calling you to do something. Something which God has prepared for you to do. Something which your own life circumstances have prepared you to do. So Esther finally came around. But before she acted, before she did anything, she turned to God in prayer. The text says that she and her attendants fasted. Prayer and fasting go together. It's a way of seeking God's will. And not only that, not only did she and her attendants fast and pray, but she asked Mordecai to get all of the community, the Jewish community, fasting and praying on her behalf. No matter what decision is in front of you, be it big or small, but especially when it's big, <laughs> turn to God in prayer. And not just for 15 seconds. Yeah, 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 I prayed. I did. I checked in with God first. 15 seconds. But keep praying. Matthew 7, 7 says, Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and the door shall be opened to you. And don't only pray yourselves. Ask your family of faith to pray with you. And for you. Having prayed and having been prayed for, Esther came up with an elaborate plan. She invited King Xerxes and Haman, just those two guys, to dinner. And Haman's probably thinking, whoo. This is all about me. Wasn't there some song? Is it, I don't know if it's country or something. You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you, or I don't know what genre of music. Haman was so vain, he thought the dinner was all about him. And in a way, he was right. Because at that dinner, Esther, Queen Esther, revealed Haman's plan and revealed that it was Haman who was behind this plan. King Xerxes was furious and had Haman impaled on that same 75-foot pole that Haman had erected for Mordecai. Oh, the turn of events. The other thing that King Xerxes did, remember that edict? They rolled the dice... There is the royal edict that the Jews should be exterminated on Adar the 13th, it was. Well, kings can't reverse kingly decrees. I don't know why, but once it's sealed with that signet ring, you can't reverse it. But what he did is he issued a subsequent edict that the Jews on Adar 13th could defend themselves which they did. When the day came about, Adar 13, the day decided upon by the casting of lots, the casting of poor, the Jews survived because they did defend themselves. And to this day, 
Jews continue to celebrate Purim. Can you say Purim? It's like the town, but it's not spelt the same, okay? The last sentence of chapter 20 in the story, and I'm sorry, I don't have the biblical reference. But it says, And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. Purim begins at sundown two weeks from now. Sundown on March 15, 2014. And the Jews, because their days start at sundown. And the Jews across the globe, including Minnesota, will gather for feasting and celebrating and gift giving and intentional service to their neighbors as they remember what God had done for them, when they remember in thanksgiving that God had delivered them and rescued them. That's their story. They celebrate that 30 days after Purim with the celebration of Passover when God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. So I want to wrap this up. What life application points are there for us? I've talked about them already, but one, like Mordecai, be resolved in your faith and don't bow down to the waves of the world. Mordecai didn't bow down to Haman, nor should we. Stand up for your faith. Like Mordecai, be an encourager. An encourager. Mordecai encouraged Queen Esther to do the right thing. Scripture tells us, Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Three, like Esther, whenever you are faced with decisions big or small, take it to God. Take it to God in prayer. Seek God's will and invite others to join you in that prayer. And finally, like Esther, be open. Be open to being used by God for such a time as this. Now instead of singing a song, we're going to show a video here. It's a video of a song called For Such a Time as This, by an artist by the name of Wayne Watson. And as you listen to it and watch it, I want you to ponder, what is God calling you to do? Or how is God calling you to live for such a time as this? Yeah.